why don't we take a quick look at the series that we just emerged out of called Origins. Now these are all of the cosmic creation stories and the epic beginning stories of ancient Israel that make up the first few chapters of Genesis. Now these are familiar stories to us for the most part, stories of Adam and Eve, of Noah's Ark and the Flood, the Tower of Babel, but over the last couple of weeks we have become increasingly aware that these stories are part of a very large collective memory and collective consciousness and it often leaves a lot of room for them to be misunderstood. Thankfully, over the last few weeks, Jeremy, Bobby, and Scott helped us to walk through a bit of the strangeness of some of these stories towards the faith that is embedded in all of them, just as the original biblical authors would like us to see. So why don't we take a quick look at some of the highlights from our last series called Origins. The story is as we might expect, a chaotic mess of storm and water, all of our fears expressed in mythic form. But then, right from the drop, it's all different, isn't it? There is no warrior god, there is no chaos serpent, there's only a brooding mother hovering calmly above the chaos. Remember in that Babylonian story, Tiamat is presented as feminine? Here, the first description of God in your Bible is the feminine Hebrew, ruach, or spirit that floats gently above the chaos of your world. And when that gentle spirit meets the waters, we see three things. Not a conflict like we might expect, but we see a forming, and then a filling, and then a resting. See, this is not an ancient attempt to communicate the science of creation. This is counter-programming designed to subvert the narrative of violent domination and bring hope to a frightened world. You ever known someone that you, you liked, you cared about them, you loved them, and they told you some really good news and you smiled, but you walked away and for some reason you were upset with them? And it didn't really make sense to you, but you felt it nonetheless. That's not facts. That's a story about scarcity that's taken over your experience of the world and it's telling you that their blessing means less for you. It's not rational. It's a mythology that undergirds our experience of the world. That's why stories like Genesis are important for us. Not because they pretend to answer our questions about science. Of course ancient people thought the earth was flat. It looked flat. Of course they thought the sky was covered with a dome of water. It fell on them sometimes. That's just basic observation. Genesis is important because it offers us an alternative mythology to ground our identities in. And see, this story doesn't even attempt to explain why God prefers Abel. And I don't even think that's the point. The point isn't that God prefers Abel. The point is that Cain thinks that God does. Just like it isn't always true that someone has more or accomplishes more or inherits more and that this somehow makes them intrinsically more than me. The point is that like Cain, I think those things are true. And the truths of this ancient myth bear out in the data that contemporary social scientists like Brene Brown are finding and telling us about. That honestly, none of us can find a way to wholehearted life free from the taskmasters of productivity and performance until we stop comparing ourselves to the person beside us. It can't happen until we learn to let go of the score that we are silently keeping. In the exact measurements we take of our own selves that leave us feeling like we aren't worthy. And in some cases that somehow it feels like God is against us. Now, one way to read Noah and the Flood is to just stick with this theme of judgment. Those nasty humans, they had it coming. Who could stand for their perversion of creation? And there's justification for judgment in the text, but the craft of the story is doing more than just wagging a finger. As an origin story, we see the flip side of creation. Flood imagery is creation's return to chaos, where in Genesis 1, God put a vault between the waters above and below. Here, that vault collapses. Where in Genesis 1, God brought living creatures out of the land. Here, they die and fall back into the earth. This is decreation, the opposite of life. So much death only. There's that ark floating on the swelling sea. So not all is lost. 
The fascinating thing here is that if you read this story through the lens of indigenous or Asian or Indian theologians, you will often come across interpretations that suggest not the curse of Babel, but instead the blessing of Babel that returns us to the multiplication and diversity, the beauty of human flourishing around the earth that God had always intended. Where one cultural language sees a punishment because their language primarily tells a story of competition and domination, another cultural language will see blessing because their language primarily tells a story that comes from outside the centers of power. You got one story with two very different interpretations depending on the language that we bring with us to it.